Hi, Chem 101 students. Welcome back for week 10. Uh, we're going to be doing gases this week. We're doing chapter 6 in the textbook, uh, which is all about gases. And so the reason why we learn about gases, let's say you're going to be nurse, some of you are, uh, the, these gas properties are really important to the way our bodies work because uh, an important fact is that we must constantly inhale oxygen in order to power our met metabolic processes. And so understanding the way in which that occurs <clears throat> and the relationships between the pressure inside the lungs uh, and the volume of the lungs and, and, and how those all interrelate is important. Uh, to, it's important to know that on a fundamental level. Uh, also, if you're going into the sciences, uh, clearly this is a very important topic. A lot of uh, chemical reactions involve gases. And uh, it's important to understand the way in which uh, gas properties are measured and so that's what we're going to start with here. We're going to be talking about just general theory regarding how we, uh, we study gases. Uh, this is called the kinetic molecular theory. Then we're going to talk about a few of the variables that are important in measuring the properties of gases. And finally, we're going to go into the combined gas law, which actually has several parts to it. One of those parts will be the topic of our experiment this week, which is experiment nine in the lab manual. <clears throat> So the kinetic molecular theory, what does this mean? Well, kinetic means movement, uh, and molecular is referring to molecules. So it's saying that gases uh, are composed of molecules that are moving, and this is true for all matter. So molecules are moving around, matter is made of small particles like molecules, atoms, and so forth, and these particles are in constant random motion, meaning they have kinetic energy to them, or energy of motion. Uh, these particles have attractions and repulsions, uh, which means they have a potential energy as well. Uh, so you can think of a potential energy as like the kind of energy that you have if you walk to the top of a cliff. Uh, you, and let's say you carry a ball with you to the top of a cliff. That ball and yourself has potential energy due to the attraction between the ball and the center of the earth. And so if you drop that ball, that potential energy will then turn into kinetic energy and the ball will begin to move until it hits a surface somewhere and then that kinetic energy will, will go into uh, pushing the dirt or the earth that it hits uh, around and that kind of thing. And so in, in terms of uh, atomic and molecular particles, the potential energy that they have has to do with their electrical attractions, their electrostatic attractions between positive and negative parts of the molecules or atoms. <clears throat> So how does energy uh, come into this? Well, if we increase the temperature of the substance, what's really going on inside, if you look very closely, is that the speed of the atoms or the particles, molecules, whatever's in there is increasing the average speed. So it's, it's not true that all the molecules are moving at the same speed. Some are moving fast, some are moving slow, uh, and most of them are moving in, in between speed. But if you increase the temperature, what you're doing is increasing the average speed of these molecules. So on average, they are moving faster. <clears throat> um, these molecules do bump into one another and they transfer energy fr from one to another when they hit one another. Uh, in, in this type of energy transfer is called an inelastic collision. Uh, and you can think of that as kind of like if you're playing pool and the billiard balls hit one another uh, you you hit the cue ball and it's going fast and then it will hit another ball and maybe it will start to go more slowly and transfer most of its energy to the other ball uh, and, and it's with with molecules though uh, they don't lose any energy from hitting one another so they just keep on bouncing around all the time uh, this relates to the states of the matter as well that we went into uh, so this is way back from the the beginning when we first started when we have a solid their attractive forces are are uh, very strong compared to their forces of their motion uh, so they they stick together very strongly uh, for liquids the forces of attraction are about equal to the to the forces that are that are, are moving them around and so uh, they tend to move around one another but they're still pretty attracted to one another what we're going to be focusing on in this chapter is gases. And in gases, generally, the, the gases are gases at room temperature because the attractive forces between the molecules or atoms is quite weak. Uh, 
Uh, and so it's not enough to keep them stuck. So gas molecules tend to be far apart from one another with a lot of space in between them. And the result is that um, when we talk about a lot of properties of gases, these properties will be the same for a great for basically all gases uh, because they're mostly made up of empty space where there's a large distance between the, uh, the particles that make them up and that actually makes them quite different from solids and liquids in that respect. Uh, and so that's a, a property we're going to use and I think that's what makes studying gases very interesting is that we can apply the same general ideas to a great multitude of gases which is pretty cool. Okay. So what will determine uh, the properties of the gas? Uh, it's going to be the energy of the motion of the gas particles. So if you're looking at this balloon here, <clears throat> so we're going we're gonna to have little particles in the balloon that are moving all over the place, right? And uh, I'm going to have to, I'm just going to interrupt this real quick while I run a script to help me out here. Okay. And so uh, properties of the gas will change when we, when we change the volume or the pressure or the temperature. So we're going to be focusing on those uh, properties of a, of a gas. Now inside a balloon like this, for example, there are a bunch of gas molecules. They're spaced pretty far apart. Now in real life, the, neither the gas molecules nor the spaces are this big, but you can kind of imagine them as quite spaced apart relative to their size and they're bouncing all over. Sometimes they're hitting one another and sometimes one of them will hit the edge. And it's this, this fact that the molecules are bouncing off the edge of the balloon inside here is that's what keeps it inflated. And that pressure can be quite, quite high. For example, uh, your car is held up by tires. Um, those tires, are held up only by the pressure of the gas molecules all hitting the, the insides of the tires here uh, to keep it blown up. And so the although each of these molecules is small and each is imparting a very small force, when you add all those forces together, they're enough to hold your entire car up and keep those tires inflated even under the weight of your tire. Now, Temperature is going to be very important because when the gas molecules get hotter, what they mean is, what that means is that they're moving faster. And so the result is that they hit the sides of the container harder, which results in, well, if you have a balloon which is flexible, it may result in the balloon expanding because these little microscopic punches into the interior of the balloon that these molecules are making is Get, are getting harder, you know, faster and faster and harder and harder little punches so they're blowing up the balloon more. Now if you have another type of container like a tank or your car tire where it can't expand too much past a certain point, uh, then instead what will happen is the pressure inside gets higher. And uh, we're going to talk about how that affects things like measuring the air pressure in your tire. Uh, when you measure the air pressure in your tire, you want to measure it when the tire is is uh, room temperature cool, not after you've been driving it because the pressure will be different because the gas molecules will be hotter inside the, the tire after you have driven it and, uh, and, and so the pressure will be higher than it would have been if the tire was cool or cold or room temperature at least. Okay, so that's the kind of picture that we want from the kinetic molecular theory. We want to be thinking about the molecules and how fast they're moving relative to the temperature. <clears throat> and also we're going to think about what happens when we take a balloon like this and we squeeze it down into a smaller volume uh, and, and various changes that we might make to the volume or the pressure or the temperature. But temperature is particularly important because a higher temperature means faster moving molecules and that's what you want to keep in mind when it comes to the kinetic molecular theory. So what, what are these variables that we're going to be measuring? We've mentioned pressure. So pressure is kind of a new variable that we haven't talked about yet because early in the class we talked about volumes, the amount of space uh, a sample of matter is taking up. We talked about temperatures, uh, but we didn't talk much about pressure. So we didn't talk at all about pressures in fact. So pressure we're going to indicate with a capital P as a variable. And this is the force that a gas applies on an area. Uh, 
and and uh, so this measurement is going to happen for example for your car you probably measure in terms of pounds per square inch where pounds is a force and a square inch is the area over which that force applies um, there are other ways of measuring pressure that are more common in science one of them is atmospheres so one atmosphere uh, also, which is also denoted as ATM a lot of times we're going to be doing that but one atmosphere is the air pressure at sea level uh, so if we were to go down to the beach you know like go out down to Huntington Beach or Long Beach or something right on the beach the air pressure would be about one atmosphere uh, <clears throat> but if we go higher elevation like here in San Bernardino it's slightly less than one atmosphere uh, and the higher you go up, the lower the air pressure is just because there's less air pushing down on us, less weight of air pushing down on us as you go higher and higher. This is also equal to 760 millimeters mercury. Now, I know millimeters sounds like a distance. Uh, this is called, this is the way we measure the pressure in a barometer, which is a column of mercury that will be pushed up by the air pressure. So you have a, a, an evacuated column like this, the barometer, evacuated column inverted in a pool of mercury here. And that mercury will be pushed down by the air pressure and come up a certain distance. And if you have one atmosphere pressure, this distance right here would be 760, uh, 760 mill, millimeters, 760. 760 millimeters uh, that would be this distance right here um, <clears throat> and so uh, that's where the term millimeters of mercury comes from the way it's measured in a barometer uh, this is also called tor sometimes so tor and millimeters mercury mean the same thing uh, and so these are various ways of measuring pressure and you should be able to use this conversion factor to interconvert between these two types of pressures. So this is definitely something you want to have in your handy notes when you're doing problems. <clears throat> now volume. Volume uh, is indicated with a big V as we have used before. This is the volume of a gas uh, and for, uh, for the gases well, it could be the volume of any matter, but here we're talking about gases. So uh, for a gas, the volume of the gas is going to be equal to the container that it's in because a gas can expand to fill the entire capacity of its container. Uh, and so if you have a flexible container like a balloon, this volume can change. Uh, however, if you have a rigid tank like a, a, you know, a tank of, of propane or something, or carbon dioxide or something that that's going to be uh, a fixed volume so uh, the volume can vary if you have a flexible container or it can be fixed uh, in a rigid container also an important uh, variable for gas solids will be the number of moles of gas molecules or atoms uh, and so this is going to be an important property and an important factor in the gas properties um, it basically, uh, it's not going to matter which gas that we're talking about. All that's going to impact the properties are going to be how many gas particles there are. Uh, and so that's a very interesting fact for, for, uh, for gases, and that's something we're going to get into. Finally, temperature. Temperature is going to be used a little bit differently than we have used it in the past. We're not going to be using Celsius temperatures very much in this chapter. We're going to be using Kelvin temperatures. And here's why. It's because remember, we said that in, according to the kinetic molecular theory, the uh, temperature is related to the average speed or average kinetic energy to be more exact of the molecules. And so, uh, the problem with Celsius temperatures is that you can have negative Celsius temperatures. But what we want is we want the temperature to be a, a proxy or a substitute for the speed of the molecules. So we want a kind of temperature system where 
uh, zero in the temperature scale means zero molecular motion, zero speed. And as we increase that temperature scale, it, it relates to higher and higher speeds because you can't have a negative speed, really. We don't want to have a negative speed for this purpose. And so for this reason, we use the Kelvin temperature scale. And we use it because zero Kelvin is the lowest known temperature. And so, and it, and it theoretically corresponds to zero molecular speed. And then as the te Kelvin temperature gets higher and higher, that indicates a faster and faster average speed or average kinetic energy to be more exact of the molecules. So we're gonna want all temperatures in the, these gas laws problems that we're doing to be in Kelvin. So to get the Kelvin temperature, we take the Celsius temperature and we add 273. Again, a very important a relationship that you're going to want handy in your notes. You'll probably have it memorized before we're done with this chapter because you're just going to use it so much. <clears throat> okay, so it's important that all gas, all in all gas law problems, the temperature is in Kelvin. So always keep that in mind. Should you memorize that? I think what you should do is understand that we're trying to, but with temperature, we're really trying to get at speed. And Celsius does not do that because it can be negative. Kelvin cannot. And so Kelvin does the job here of, of stating the speed of the molecules for us. Okay. So uh, we're going to have three different gas laws formulas, which we're going to soon discover actually three parts of the same big formula, which we're going to call the combined gas law because it's going to combine these three formulas. But let's uh, look at the first one. First one says if we have a closed container at a constant temperature, so this is important, temperature. So temperature is constant, constant temperature. So we don't have to worry about temperature. We're just gonna worry about here pressure and volume. And this says pressure one times volume one equals pressure two times volume two. Or another way of saying this is pressure times volume is constant uh, and so what this means here is if if we multiply the pressure and the times of volume for a particular sample of gas and then we change one of these two things let's say we change the volume of the container that the gas is in we'll get a new pressure but still the pressure times the volume will be unchanged and so what this tells us is that when one of these gets bigger the other gets smaller. If you want to verify that, you could put in some numbers, uh, like let's say we have a pressure, I'm just going to put in simple numbers, a pressure of three, and the volume then is two. But then let's say we increase the volume until it's three. Then what the, does the pressure have to be? Well, if pressure times volume here is three times two, six, then the pressure here must be two because two times three will also be six. So what this shows you is that if the volume goes up, the pressure goes down, and, and, and so they go opposite to one another. We say that these are inversely proportional to one another. When one gets bigger, the other gets smaller. This is something you, you've probably experienced if you've, ever, uh, if you've ever squeezed a balloon. So I call this one the squeezing the balloon. Squeeze the balloon. Uh, in terms of how I remember it or how you might remember it. So if you take a balloon and you squeeze it down and make the volume smaller, so I'm like squeezing this balloon down, what is it that you're going to feel when you're trying to squeeze this balloon and, and, and the gas inside of this balloon into a smaller space? You're going to feel more and more pressure pu pushing back on you. And this is because you're squeezing the molecules in the balloon into a smaller space. So now they're punching the, the walls more frequently and you're feeling a stronger pressure. And so uh, this is the one that just as a memorizing tool, I call this the squeezing the balloon. And the result is that you're the one you're familiar with. If you squeeze down the volume, the pressure gets bigger. So these go opposite to one another. For the next uh, type, if we have a closed container at constant pressure, so this is for the next type of formula that we have, the relationship here is volume over temperature is constant. 
uh, here. So volume over temperature is constant. So that's what we're saying here. Or another way of saying it is volume one divided by temperature one equals volume two divided by temperature two. So if you change one of these two, the other one will change too. And this type of mathematics tells us that when one gets bigger, the other also gets bigger. They're directly proportional. Just to give you some simple numbers, let's say that my volume is four here and my temperature is two, okay? And let's say though that I change my temperature, I move it up to three. Then what is the new volume? Well, if this is going to divide, four divided by two is two. So if this ratio is going to stay the same, this must be a six now, right? So you can see as the temperature went up, the volume also went up. These are directly proportional to one another. When one goes up, the other one also goes up. Uh, and this makes sense, right? If the pressure is staying the same, this would be like the balloon that we were talking about. So we had the picture of the balloon, and when the temperature is going up, what that means is that the molecules are moving faster inside the balloon. And so I had drawn on that picture the molecules moving faster, so they're hitting the insides of the balloon harder, which would cause the balloon to get blown up. The volume would increase. <clears throat> Likewise, um, so you can actually try this at home. Uh, you can blow up a balloon, and if you very carefully, with your tongs from the kitchen, hold the balloon over some boiling water, what you will see is as the balloon heats up, as long as you don't touch it on the edge of your pan, uh, you could probably pop it then, you're gonna see the balloon start to expand. And this is because the molecules inside the balloon are moving faster, so they start to punch the insides of the balloon harder, and that causes it to blow up, that causes the volume to increase. In this situation, the, uh, the, um, the pressure is constant, because it's just the air pressure on the outside of the balloon. So this would be like the hot balloon, hot balloon. Uh, we'll get, we'll get a, it will, or you could have a cold balloon. Uh, it's really cool if you have something really cold, like dry ice, you don't always have dry ice, but if you put a balloon against a dry ice, it will shrink. When the temperature goes down, the volume will go down. Finally, uh, for a closed container at constant volume, so this one is constant volume. If the volume remains the same, then we say pressure one over temperature one equals pressure two over temperature two. And this math works out just like the volume and the temperature one does. So if we uh, have a higher temperature, the pressure inside will be the same if the volume stays the same. This one I, I like to call the hot car tire. Hot car tire. So you can actually try this at home too or in your car, if you've got a car, you can measure the pressure in your tires, they, and then you, and while they're cold, it especially works on a cold day. So you measure the pressure in your tires, and then you go and drive your car on the freeway, and then when you get out, check your pressure again, and you'll find that the pressure is higher. Because the tire is not able to expand in volume very much, so instead what happens is the faster molecules inside the tire are hitting the, the sides harder, which is resulting in a higher pressure inside the tire. Uh, so that's the hot car tire. And these all have other names like Charles Law, Boyle's Law. I don't really care that you memorize those names, okay? They're gonna be in your textbook, but I don't even know which one's which. Who cares uh, what dead person it was named after? What matters is that you understand uh, well, how this works, right? Uh, and in all of these, we're, we haven't said anything about the number of moles of gas. So the number of moles of gas will be important, uh, but these, these rules that we've studied so far have been, assumed that we have a constant number of moles of gas as well. So let's see how we might be able to use these relationships. Uh, so when we use these, we're gonna wanna pay close attention to which, which variables are mentioned in our problem. So for example, you know, if pressure and volume are mentioned, we'll want to use this first equation here. If volume and temperature are the variables that are mentioned, we'd want to use this one here. And if pressure and temperature are mentioned, these are the, this is the equation that we want to use. Finally, 
we can put these all together and get a combined gas law. Uh, so let me write, so if we look at these all, I'm gonna derive this for you. Notice that in all of these, the pressure is on the top. Pressure on the top of the fraction here, pressure on the top of the fraction. Also on top is the volume, volume. And then on the bottom, in both of these bottom equations is the temperature. So if you combine all these equations into one, you get pressure times volume over temperature is constant. Um, and so this is, or, or another way of writing this is P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. And this is going to be referred to as the, uh, the combined gas law. Now let me show you why this is true, why this, this equation will reduce down to the rest of these, uh, assuming that you, uh, you, you have a constant of one of these. So in the first equation, for example, it's constant temperature, right? So let's say our temperature is constant and it doesn't change. So if we have constant temperature, constant temperature, that means that T1 and T2 are equal. So what I can do is I can say, well, this T2 is equal to T1, so I can just call it T1. And then if I multiply both sides times T1, well then my uh, T1s cancel. T1 divided by T1 is one, and T1 divided by T2, which is the same as T1 since it's constant temperature. Those cancel, and what do I get? I get P1V1 equals P2V2, which was the same as the first equation, which is true at constant temperature. Let's say instead I have constant, uh, I have constant volume, okay? Let's say I have constant volume. If I have constant volume, That means that V1 is the same as V2. It means the volume didn't change. So I could then call this the same as V1. Now, if I multiply both sides times one divide by V1, one divide by V1, then my V1s cancel, and this is also V1 since they're the same, and I get P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Well, if I go back to the last slide, it says if we have constant volume, P1 over T1 equals P2 over v T2. So the result is that if one of these variables is constant, it reduces to one of the other simpler equations. And so in fact, those three equations are really all one equation, this combined gas law. But if one of the variables is constant, you can remove it from the equation. So you don't really have three equations that you have to memorize. You have just one. It's this one. And if one of the variables is constant, you can take it out. <clears throat> but rather than memorize it, I hope that you take the time to understand the equation and the, what, why they work the way they work. Like remember the squeeze the balloon, the hot balloon, the hot car tire, so you can understand why the math is laid out this way. Uh, when you squeeze the balloon, the volume goes down, the pressure goes up. That's this kind of math right here. When you make the balloon hotter, the volume also gets bigger. The hot balloon, that's this math right here. When your car tire gets hot, its volume can't change, but as the temperature increases, the pressure also increases. That's the hot car tire, and that this math relates to that. And so I'd say don't memorize this equation so much as try to understand it. So let's do some problems now using this equation. Problem one. So what is the pressure of two liters of gas at 0 0.98 atmospheres that is compressed to 0 0.5 liters of volume? So when you look at a question like this, first you should analyze it and see what is there. So here we have a two liters, okay? That is a volume, so that's definitely a volume. And then this one, 0.98 atmospheres. Atmospheres is a pressure unit, so this is a pressure here. 
And then we have another volume here, and this is a different volume, okay? So what you have to do is you have to make sure that you line up your V1 and P1 so that they're referring to the same situation. If we call this volume V1, the P1 has to be the pressure when the volume is V1. This is the pressure when the volume is V1. When volume is two liters, pressure is 0.98 atmospheres. So if we call this V1, we have to call this P1. And then this is a different volume, so we call this V2. And we're asked, what is the pressure? What is the pressure? So this is saying, what is P2? Okay. And so we're going to be solving for P2 here, which means we want to use the equation P1 V1 equals P2 V2. So only volume and pressure are changing. The pressure is given in atmospheres, and so we do want to keep our units so that we make sure we know what unit the pressure will be in at the end. So make sure to keep your units. I do insist that you put them in. We use this equation, P1 V1 equals P2 V2. We're going to put in P1 as 0.98 atmospheres and V1 as 2 liters, like this. P2, that's what we want to find out. And for our V2, that's going to be 0 0.50 liters. Now, what we can do is we want to isolate P2. So what we're going to do is divide each side by 0 0.5 liters. Uh, whoops. So what I'll do is I'm going to divide this side by 0 0.50 liters. And I'm going to divide this side by 0 0.50 liters. And so then these will cancel and I'll have just P2, and now I just have to calculate this. So let's get out the calculator. I'm gonna say 0 0.98 0 times 2.0, and then divide by 0 0.5. And that gives us 3.92. However, all of our data here has two sig figs, so we're gonna write this with two sig figs. We're gonna say 3.9, and our units, Notice the units here. Liters cancel. Liters cancel with liters. And we have atmospheres left. So our value is 3.9 and our unit is atmospheres. And that is our P2. And so that's how you do a problem like this. Let's look at another example. What is the volume of a 1.5 liter balloon of gas at 25 degrees Celsius that is heated to 85 degrees Celsius? Okay, so let's look at what we've got here uh, for our, what we're given. We're given a volume, we can tell because it's liters. So this is gonna be a volume. And then 25 degrees Celsius, that is a temperature. And 85 degrees Celsius, that is a temperature. So uh, <clears throat> here, we're, this is our volume we're given, we'll call this V1, and that is the volume when the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, so we're going to call this T1. Then the balloon is heated, and so it gets a new temperature, 85 degrees Celsius, we're going to call this T2. And then it, we're asked here, what is the volume? What is the volume? So that's the volume when the temperature is 85 degrees Celsius. So this is going to be V2. So since we have temperatures and volumes here, and nothing is said about the pressure, so the pressure must be constant, we're going to use the equation that involves volumes and temperatures. And that equation goes like this, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Now there's something we have to be very careful about. The problem with Celsius temperatures is they are not the temperature that we're looking for. They do not relate to us the speed of the molecules. So we need to translate the temperature into kelvins, which does relate to the speed of the molecules. So we add 273 to each of these temperatures. So we have 25 degrees Celsius plus 273, that's T1. It's 298 Kelvin. And for T2, we have 85 degrees Celsius plus 273. That is 358 Kelvin. So now this is what we want to use for T1. And this is what we want to use for T2, the Kelvin temperatures. 
So now we're ready to plug in to V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. So let's plug in. For V1, we're going to plug in 1.5 liters. I'll just write them above. Uh, so 1.5 liters. For T1, we're going to put in the temperature here, 298 Kelvin. For V2, we're going to put in, we don't know, that's what we're trying to find out. And for T2, we're going to put in 358 Kelvin. Okay, and this is liters, by the way, not a 2, 1.5 liters. So we plug those in. So 1.5 liters over 298 Kelvin equals V2, we don't know what it is, over 358 Kelvin. Uh, I'm going to, now that we've got these in here, I'm going to erase what I put here. Plug them in now. Okay, now here's where things get a little bit tricky. Uh, or they will get trickier even more when we want to solve for temperature. But uh, here, what we need to do is we need to solve for V2. We need to get rid of the 358 Kelvin. So we're going to multiply both sides by 358 Kelvin here. And so those will cancel right here. And then on the left side here, we're going to get uh, 1.5 liters times 358 Kelvin. So all of this will equal V2. That's the only thing that's left. So on this side, all we've got left is V2. So that's right there. Then the other side is 358 Kelvin times 1.5 liters on the top. On the bottom is what we have here, 298 Kelvin. And now we're going to do our math. We'll use our calculator. We should pay attention to the units too. The Kelvin units are going to cancel and we'll just have units of liters. So in the end, we're going to write our answer in liters, but we just have to calculate how many liters that is. So we're going to have 358 times 1.5 divide by 298. And uh, for our sig figs, the 358 and the 298 have three sig figs. Uh, they have three sig figs because remember when you add, you look at the place value. So this was a ones place, ones place, ones place, ones place. So our last sig figs at the ones place. These are both end up having three sig figs because remember when we add or subtract, we don't count sig figs, we look at the place value. But now that we're multiplying and dividing, we count the sig figs. So the 358 and the 298 had three sig figs, but the 1.5 that we were given only has two. So our answer needs to have two sig figs. Uh, so our answer is going to be 1.8 and the unit will be liters. So V2 is 1.8 liters. Okay. So there's that one. Let's do another one. So here's another one. Uh, so this is a problem about a can of gas. Uh, if you ever had a can of hairspray or, or anything that's pressurized like this uh, air duster right here this is pressurized, you'll see that uh, it will tell you to, uh, to, to keep it at a particular temperature, right? Don't let it get hot, basically. Uh, and this is because if it gets hot, it can explode, uh, you know. So it's because the pressure in the can will get so big that it could explode. And so for that reason, uh, that, that's a relationship to gas laws here. And so uh, let's say we had a can and inside the can is 1.4 atmospheres. The temperature is just you know, a little warm room, 27 degrees, like a warm room, but then it's heated to like 97 degrees. So what will be the pressure of, of the can then? Well, let's identify what we have here. We've got pressure and temperatures only. Okay. Our, uh, our temperature here is 27 degrees Celsius. If we call this T1, then this pressure is P1 because that's the pressure when the temperature is 27 degrees Celsius. Then we have a new temperature, it's temperature two, and we're asked to find what is the pressure? What is the pressure? So the, what we want to find is we're trying to find P2. Now remember, 
Celsius is not a temperature that tells us about the speed of the molecules. So what we need to do is add these up, add these to 273 so that we get Kelvin temperatures. So 27 degrees Celsius plus 273 is 300 Kelvin. And notice how I've written this. I wrote this with a decimal point because what I'm trying to say is this zero is significant here. Uh, because we're adding, so we look at the place value, one's place, one's place, our last sig fig should be at the ones place right here. Likewise, if we take 97 and we add to it 273, we get 370. And again, I put the decimal point at the end because I'm trying to indicate that this zero is significant. Uh, because again, this the, we're adding a number that its last sig fig is at the ones place, the ones place. And so the ones place here is the last significant digit. So now this is what we're gonna call T1 because it's in Kelvin and this is what we're going to call T2 and that's what we're going to plug in. So since it's pressures and temperatures we're going to be using the equation P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. And so we're going to now plug these in. Uh, for pressure 1 we're going to plug in 1.4 atmospheres that's going to go right here. For temperature one, it's 300 Kelvin, that goes here. For T2, it's 370 Kelvin, that's gonna go right there. So uh, we've got 1.4 atmospheres, again, T1, 300 Kelvin. P2, we're trying to find, and T2 is gonna be 370 Kelvin, right here. Okay, now again, we've got to get rid of the things that are not P2 on the right, because we're trying to solve for P2 here. So what we've got to do is we've got to multiply both sides by 370 Kelvin. So that's going to cancel out on the right side here, 370 Kelvin, leaving just the P2. And if we're multiplying by 370 Kelvin here, we'll get all of the rest of this on the other side. So we've got P2, that's this right here, and that's gonna equal 370 Kelvin times 1.4 atmospheres. And on the bottom will be 300 Kelvin. Notice what's going to happen to the units here. The Kelvin units are going to cancel and we're going to get units of pressure in atmospheres. Again, super important that you keep your units so that you know what units you have at the end. Also, it helps you if you accidentally multiply or divide wrong, you'll be able to catch it because you'll notice that your units didn't cancel right. Keeping your units is a secret weapon in the physical sciences. If you do it, you will get more problems right than the person that doesn't. Guaranteed. It got me through even grad school a lot of the times. Just, just doing that when other people wouldn't. Anyway, uh, let's now calculate what the result will be in atmospheres. It's going to be 370 times 1.4 divide by 300. And so our new pressure, uh, which we're going to say state to two sig figs since the 1.4 has two sig figs, it's going to be 1.7 atmospheres. 1.7 atmospheres is our pressure there. And lastly, here, let's do another problem. Uh, in this one, this is a, a question about your car tires. Okay, so. Uh, for this one, we're going to be solving for the temperature, and this is where I'm going to show you where the math can be tricky when you're solving for temperature, and you're going to want to be very careful to do this math correctly, okay? So let's, let's see what's going on here. So it says the air pressure in your car tires is 32 PSI in the morning. This 32 PSI is going to be our P1. Uh, and the temperature is... 17 degrees Celsius, T1. After you drive for a while with your car, you go and check the uh, pressure again, and it's a new pressure. This P2 is 36 PSI. What is the temperature in the tire? Okay, so this is actually the real life version of the hot car tire. Uh, you can see the pressure went up. It's because the, the, the the tire got hotter, so the question is, how much hotter did it get? Okay, so since only pressure and temperature are in the problem, we're going to be using P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. 
again. Uh, again, our temperature needs to be in Kelvin. So we're gonna take the 17 and add 273, and we get 290 Kelvin. And again, our last sig fig is right here at the zero. That's why I put the decimal point, because we're adding two numbers where the last sig fig is at the ones place. And so for this one, the last sig fig is at the ones place. So we get 290 with a decimal point to indicate that the zero is significant. Now we're going to be applying P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. And so we're going to be plugging in our values. Our P1 is 32 PSI or pounds of per square inch. There's another thing I wanna point out here is that PSI is not one of the units that we've been using. It's not atmospheres, it's not millimeters mercury. For this kind of problem with combined gas law, it doesn't matter what units you're using as long as the units are consistent and they cancel correctly. So that's another reason why you really need to keep your units in these problems, okay? Make sure that you do. Next, we'll plug in the temperature one, which was 290 Kelvin. Uh, we'll plug in pressure two now, which was 36 PSI. And then temperature two is what we're trying to find. Now, an important point, a lot of people make a mistake here, and I'm gonna show you where they make the mistake. First of all, we want T2 by itself. So let's say to get T2 by itself, what we're gonna do is divide each side by 36 PSI. So I'm multiplying times one over 36 PSI, and I do that on the other side too. So that cancels my 36 PSI, but that does not leave me temperature two. This is the, the, pro, the, the uh, mistake that many, many students make. This is not T2, this is one over T2. T2 is on the bottom, okay? So you've got to be very careful there that you don't think that this is T2. This is one over T2. So that's what we're gonna write like right here. One over T2, okay? And what that equals is on the top 32 PSI times one, that's just 32. And on the bottom, 36 PSI times 290 Kelvin right here. Now what we can do to fix this is we can flip both sides. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna flip both sides. That is an allowed mathematical rule. Okay, we, as long as we flip both sides. Okay. And so uh, why does this work? I'll show you an example with normal numbers. One over two equals uh, two over four. Okay, if I flip this, I get two over one equals four over two, or two over one is two, four over two is two. So you can flip both sides and still have the same thing. So that's essentially what we're doing here. We're flipping, so we get T2 over one, which is just T2, and then we're gonna have this bottom part here now is on the top, 36 PSI over 290 Kelvin. And then on the bottom we have 32 PSI right here. And now we can calculate. So be very careful with the T. Remember that it's on the bottom. So we have to be careful what we do here and make sure that our math is done correctly. Okay, finally, now we can punch in the numbers. Uh, by the way, our, our pounds per square inch, we know that we did this okay because they're gonna cancel. And our temperature units are gonna be Kelvin in the end. Okay. So 36 times 290 divided by 32 equals, and uh, we're gonna want this with uh, a couple of sig figs. It would technically technically be two sig figs because the PSIs here are, are two sig figs. So we would say technically it would be 330 Kelvin. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do one more thing and I'm gonna turn it back to Celsius. Uh, and so I'm gonna do minus 273, just so I can easily see the difference in temperature. And the new temperature is 53 degrees Celsius about. Uh, we can't know this exactly because we only had two sig figs. So really we can only say it's like, since this was the last sig fig, we can only say we know to 50. But um, you can see here that that's a significant increase in temperature, right? And that resulted in a, in a slight increase here in the pressure. 
on a Kelvin scale, it's not a huge increase in temperature. And so that's why you don't see a huge increase in the pressure, but it is measurable. You can notice it uh, if you're measuring your car tires. Lastly, we're gonna do uh, one more problem that's going to involve the full combined gas law. So it says we have a 1.8 liter balloon. So liters is a volume, so let's call this volume one. And it is at 0.99 atmospheres. Atmospheres is a pressure, so we're gonna call this pressure one. And the temperature is 27 degrees Celsius, so we'll call this T1. But then we change it, we get a new pressure, the new pressure is 0.78 atmospheres, we'll call that P2. The new temperature is 22 degrees Celsius, we'll call that T2. And then we're asked for, what is the volume? What is the volume? So we're gonna call that volume V2, V2. And so since we have pressure, volume, and temperature, what that means is we've got to use P1, V1 over T1, equals p2 v2 over t2 and so that's the equation we're going to be using and so first we need to get our temperatures straight they need to be in kelvins so t1 is 27 degrees celsius we add 273 we get 300 kelvin t2 is 22 degrees celsius so we add 273 we get 295 kelvin so now we've got our temperatures in kelvins we're ready to go uh, P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. I accidentally overwrote my stuff there, but yeah. And we'll just put this back. This is V2 right here. So we're trying to find V2. That's what we want. So we're going to plug in everything else. So uh, P1 here is 0.99 atmospheres. We're going to put that right there. V1 is 1.8 liters. We're going to put that right here. All right, and T1 is 300 Kelvin, so we're going to put that right down there. And that's going to be equal to, and then P2, so P2 is 0.78 atmospheres, we'll put that here, times V2, V2 is what we're trying to find, and then over T2, which we'll put the Kelvin amount, 295 Kelvin. And so what we want to do is we want to get V2 by itself. So now we've got two things to get rid of on this side. We've got to get rid of the 0.78 atmospheres, and we've got to get rid of the 295 Kelvin. So the way we can get rid of 295 Kelvin is by multiplying both sides by 295 Kelvin. So that's gonna cancel this. But we also have to divide by 0.78 atmospheres to cancel that one. So since we multiplied by 295 Kelvin and divided by 0.78 atmospheres on this side, we'll do the same on the other side. And uh, our 295 Kelvin is going to cancel here on this side. And our 0.78 atmosphere is going to cancel on this side. So all we've got left here is V2. Great. So we're going to have V2 equals <clears throat> uh, 0.99 atmospheres here. Also 1.8 liters. But also on top is going to be 295 Kelvin. That will go right there. Oops, the 300 Kelvin is still there too. We're going to add these now too. 295 Kelvin on the, on the top, 0.78 atmospheres in the bottom. Now here's where you need to be very, very careful with the way you punch this in. Uh, remember my cardinal rule of punching in. If it's on the top, press times. If it's on the bottom, press divide. You follow that rule, you always get it right. You break it, you'll probably get it wrong. Also, let's note our units here. Kelvins are going to cancel with Kelvins. Atmospheres are going to cancel with atmospheres. So our unit at the end will be liters. That's the only unit we have left. Watch the way I punch this in. Okay. Now, it doesn't matter the order I punch this in. I could punch any number in any order. Okay. Uh, but what matters is that for the numbers that are on the bottom, I press divide before I put them in. And for the numbers that are on the top, I press times. So 295 times 0 0.99 since it's on the top, times 1.8 since it's on the top, divide by 0.78 since it's on the bottom. Then you better not hit times, hit divide. 
by 300 because 300 is on the bottom. So you hit divide before you enter it. Otherwise you get the wrong answer. Now we're gonna do this with two sig figs. So it's gonna be 2.2 .2, and the unit will be liters. So the volume two is 2.2 .2 liters. And that's the way you do combined gas law problems. Uh, so what we've done in this section is we've done kind of a kind of problem where we have an initial pressure, volume, and or temperature, and then it changes, and we calculate a new pressure, volume, and or temperature. But uh, what if we don't have a change? What if we want to know, like we have the pressure and the volume now, we want to know the temperature, or something like that without any changes. That's what it's going to be our next topic is going to be about. It's called the ideal gas law. And I'll talk about this in the next lecture, and I'll see you then.